Hey, so welcome to Earth, a webcast featuring interviews with people working on the front lines of conservation and human rights. Today, we're welcoming back uh, human rights attorney Terry Collingsworth to get an update on his latest progress. Welcome back to Earth, Terry. How are you doing today? Thank you for having me. I'm doing well. I feel optimistic and spring has arrived in D.C., so let's put a little spring in our steps here. That's great news. Great to hear. So uh, just for our viewers that don't know, uh, last December, you guys were in the U.S. Supreme Court defending six uh, children uh, or former children against Nestle and Cargill. Can you tell us how that went and what the angle of their defense was? The, the argument went remarkably well. We were concerned and remain concerned that our Supreme Court is quite conservative. And we were defending a victory in the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. So it's kind of a cliche almost that uh, when the when the Supreme Court takes a decision from the Ninth Circuit, they usually are, are not going to agree with it. They usually are going to overturn it. So we were very concerned when they accepted the case for review. But we did, a, I, thought, I think, a very good job on the briefs and uh, the companies thinking that they had a court in their favor, a conservative court. The companies uh, reached too far, I think. Their main argument was that corporations cannot be liable under international law for child slavery. I mean, just saying that out loud is outrageous. And when, when they filed their briefs and really emphasized that point, we, we grew optimistic. And uh, the, it was just wonderful, though. When the argument started, they hired Neil Kochel, who was uh, Obama's uh, acting solicitor general, argued a ton of cases in the Supreme Court. So they went out and got their big gun, who embarrassed himself both in, in front of the court but in the legal community by standing up and saying that Nestle and Cargill are immune from child slavery. So even the two most conservative justices on the Supreme Court, Alito and Thomas, they ate him alive. I mean, they asked him hypotheticals like, you mean to tell me that if 12 individuals were enslaving children, that they would be liable. But if they got smart and formed a corporation, they were suddenly free to enslave people. I mean, I, I just can't believe how, how horrible these companies are. And I always want to stress that they probably spent a million bucks or more on the lawyers getting ready for writing the briefs and, and, and just on the Supreme Court appeal alone. And they would rather do that than sit down with us and figure out how to stop using child slaves in their cocoa supply chain. That is outrageous. And I, I hope that they can hear from anyone watching this. Uh, you can go on my website, iradvocates.org, and you get addresses for email, Twitter, uh, and, and let these companies know that they should not be advocating for legal slavery in the year 2021. And let's not forget, these are African children. These companies, uh, when Black Lives Matter exploded last summer, they were uh, showing their solidarity with tweets like, we're with Black Lives Matter. It's like, what really, uh, what about those kids you're enslaving in Africa right now today? Wow. So do you, do you have a sense of how the result is going to go? And, and when will you find out? The Supreme Court's only deadline is the end of its term on June 30th. And uh, they tend to hold on to important decisions until then. Uh, so we're expecting sometime in June we'll get a decision. I think that the court is not going to be known as the court that legalized corporate slavery. I just don't think they're going to do it. So what should happen is they deny that argument. And then there is an additional issue of whether we have satisfied their test for extraterritorial jurisdiction uh, that they, they created uh, a few years ago in a case called Kiobo versus Royal Dutch Shell. That remains an issue of whether our pleadings meet that test. What they should do and what the Ninth Circuit recommended doing is sending it back to the trial court where we will amend the complaint and hopefully after all of this time start our, our process to take them to trial and hold them accountable for years, decades of using child slaves in their cocoa production. Okay, well, fingers crossed that goes well for you guys. More recently, you've sued several major chocolate companies under the Trafficking Victims Protection Reauthorization Act. Can you tell us what the difference is between the TVRPA and the Alien Tort Statute, please? Yes, uh, the Alien Tort Statute 
goes back to our very first Congress in 1789, passed this law that has only 16 words and essentially allows an alien to sue in tort for violations of the law of nations. So essentially it's a universal jurisdiction statute for the most fundamental human rights. Corporations have, have been trying to kill this statute since we started using it in 1996 in the first case against Unical Union Oil of California. They have banded together, they file amicus briefs and so on. And the Supreme Court has largely cooperated and created new hurdles for cases under that statute. Because it was so broad in general, it lends itself to that kind of interpretation, even though our Supreme Court claims to be textualist and originalist when they want to hurt people at the exp and help corporations, they manage to create whole new standards out of uh, thin air. But they've, they've limited the alien tort statute. The Trafficking Victims Protection Reauthorization Act, the TVPRA, it's been around since 1990. Uh, it was enacted by President Clinton, but it was always a criminal provision. Recently, there were amendments in 2008 and 2016 that have created now a civil cause of action for forced labor or trafficking. The beauty of this statute is it, it looks like it was pretty much designed for supply chain type situations. You don't have to show like that the parent company was on the ground enslaving children. You merely have to show that the, the forced labor or trafficking was part of their supply chain and that they're in a venture with their suppliers. And the other great thing about it is it, it's extraterritorial and uh, it's a very clear, specific statute that will be hard to tinker with. The downside of it, it doesn't replace the ATS because it only applies to trafficking and forced labor. But in our case, we now represent eight uh, formerly enslaved children who were trafficked and forced to harvest cocoa. And uh, we fit that statute perfectly. And this time we've named all of the big companies as defendants. So that's uh, Nestle, Cargill, Mars, Hershey, Barry Calibut, Mondelez, and Ola. Because in some of my discussions with the companies, they keep pointing fingers at each other like, well, we would do a better job, but we would be at a, com a competitive disadvantage from Cargill or, or Olam if we did the right thing. So I, I fixed that for them. I sued them all. And I'm going to make every single one of them comply with a promise they made to our Congress in 2001 that they didn't need to be regulated, that they were going to voluntarily fix the problem. They've had 20 years of uh, permission to enslave children, and this has to stop. Exactly. And what's been the response to, to this action that you've just taken? Well, we just filed it about three weeks ago, so our process is now moving. Uh, the companies. Uh, some of them have been served. We have to formally deliver the complaint to them. Some of them are in process, but they will then officially get 30 days to answer the complaint. But I'm certain that they will contact me and ask us to agree to a schedule so that they can file motions to dismiss, which is what normally happens here. And uh, I would say by early summer, we'll have that briefing completed and the issue will be ready for the court to decide. The issue, the first issue for the court to decide if they file a motion to dismiss is whether we have met all of the legal elements of the TVPRA with our allegations. And if so, then we get discovery, which in itself would be a victory. That means I get to take the depositions of all the corporate executives. I get all of their documents. I get everything they know about their supply chain, and, and it's going to be fun. They've been hiding this stuff from the public for a long time, and I'm, I hope that we're able to uh, finally put, shine some light on this and also show them how they could actually fix this problem. It's a very fixable problem. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious, is there, is there now an emerging risk for these major forward-facing brands that some enterprising lawyers will see this as an opportunity? They could travel to Guatemala, walk 20 feet into a coffee plantation and find young children working and then file a lawsuit? Is that the way that this could go long term? Yes, uh, unfortunately, there are so many instances in the global supply chains of child slavery, forced labor, trafficked children that... Uh, 
Yes, I think if I show that you can do this uh, and uh, we are successful, I think you're going to see a whole lot of accountability uh, being driven by creative lawyers. And I myself have been invited to go to Guatemala and take a look at uh, Nestle and uh, Starbucks coffee plantations. Uh, they've been publicly busted by uh, Channel 4 in uh, London, a really terrific film that showed uh, not only the kids harvesting the, the coffee, but uh, they followed the truck to the processing plants that had Nestle and, uh, and Starbucks signs. There's, there's no question that they're doing that. So yes, there are plenty of opportunities in the global economy for accountability. So we recently interviewed Anna Hinoosa of the U.S. Customs and Border Protection about their recent filing of a withhold release order against a Malaysian palm oil company that was found to have potentially breached 11 of the ILO in the case of forced labor. What is your thoughts on the use of using these with, withhold release orders? It's an extremely powerful tool that is underutilized. Um, we filed a petition against the cocoa companies, oh, probably back in 2000, so 20 years ago. But at that time, there was a giant loophole in the law that if there wasn't sufficient uh, production to meet consumptive demand in the United States, that even though you are in violation of the statute, you could continue to export to the U.S. So that was the ruling in our first petition that even though the companies were using child slavery to harvest their cocoa, we don't have any domestic production. So the loophole applied and they were able to continue doing it. Bernie Sanders uh, at that time was on my board of directors and he legislatively plugged that hole up. So now that defense no longer applies. And on February 14th, it was Valentine's Day last year, 2020, we filed a, a brand new petition seeking to ban the importation of cocoa by all the companies we just sued. And uh, it's been pending for a bit, a bit over a year. I think that uh, the Trump administration wasn't particularly known for caring about uh, African children or slavery or uh, hurting business in any way. So they didn't take any action on it. But we are back in discussions with uh, Customs and Border Protection and some of these other rulings, like you mentioned, palm oil, and there's a cotton ruling uh, and tobacco coming in from Malawi with forced uh, child labor. So I, I think that uh, they're gonna take action on our petition. And the important thing that I hope everyone realizes, the companies and Customs and Border Protection, is this, this is such a powerful tool. It bans the importation completely of products that are in any part made with child forced child labor. So this could potentially prevent all chocolate from Cote d'Ivoire coming in to the United States until they fix it. And the statute does allow for that. It shifts the burden of proof against the company. So for example, if they find that Nestle's cocoa has forced labor as we have established, I think, uh, Nestle can't import uh, in the United States any cocoa coming from Cote d'Ivoire until they have established a credible system that demonstrates that their particular shipments no longer are using uh, child slavery. So even the threat of that happening, a credible threat of that happening should get the company's attention. And I hope it drives them to the table to talk with us about how they can fix their longstanding and, and, and uh, extremely horrific practice of using children to harvest their cocoa. Can I ask you, uh, for a company that's received a withhold release order, does that then open them up to the risk of litigation for the TVR Act? Absolutely, that's a that's a great point. If if there is if there is evidence that they are in fact using forced child labor or forced labor at all, that would be a prima facie case under the uh, TVPRA. So yes, I, I imagine lawyers right now are looking at the palm oil cases and the cotton. And uh, I know for a fact uh, some British lawyers, Martin Day's firm is looking at uh, uh, going after British American tobacco because of the Malawi order. Um, so yes, it, it becomes a virtuous cycle. You're gonna be held accountable one way or the other if you're a company that is profiting from forced or trafficked labor. Yeah. Just going back to your petition, I noticed that one of the companies that you've identified as Barry Calaboon, now they make chocolate for other brands. So if you're 
buying cho uh, chocolate from them and rebranding it, are you at risk from having your chocolate detained at, at U.S. ports of entry if the position is successful? Absolutely. That uh, the, the order that we've asked for would ban the importation of all of uh, Barry Calibut's uh, cocoa from coming into the United States. So any of the companies that they supply, including Tony Chocoloni, that is a very now high profile company claiming to not use child labor, their cocoa would be banned. And then that burden would shift, as I said, to demonstrate that they're in fact not using uh, child labor in the, in the harvesting of their particular cocoa. But every processing plant that I've seen and every uh, gathering point of the beans in Cote d'Ivoire that I've seen, uh, the one thing that you notice is how they mix everything together pretty quickly. I, I, I just I don't believe that uh, anyone could be buying from Barry Calibut and say that their cocoa is somehow better than the rest of Barry Calibut's cocoa. I just don't believe it. So in 2019, you, you also sued several tech giants on behalf of parents from the Democratic Republic of Congo for the wrongful death of their children who were killed mining cobalt, found the batteries. What has been the response from those companies so far? The companies all filed a joint motion to dismiss, arguing that they can't be responsible for what happens in their uh, distant supply chain of cobalt over in the DRC. They're essentially taking the head in the sand approach and saying to the court, we don't even know where the Democratic Republic of Congo is. How can we be responsible? But fortunately, these companies, I I'm surprised at how Apple and Tesla and the other tech companies are as bad as Exxon, Mobil, and Nestle. They, I thought they might take a different tact and try to just fix it and, and show the public they're a better company than they're traditionally we've experienced with large corporations. But no, they're just as bad. So. They're lying to the court saying they have no idea what's going on. But on their websites, they all have these policies against human rights violations, including specifically child labor. And they're basically bragging to the public that they have the right to inspect at all points and they, they enforce strictly their policy against child labor. So in our response to their motion to dismiss, I was able to quote back their policies and say, well, apparently you, you do know what's going on. You promised everyone you've stopped using child labor. And I think that's going to be the, the, what hangs them in the end is you can't have it both ways. Mm -hmm. you, you're, what you're telling the public has to be the same thing you're telling the court. And it has to be the truth. Because my job as a lawyer for these kids who died or were severely maimed, my job is to prove that they did it. And I'm going to, I think I already have, but... We're not going to just let them get away with lying about it. Mm -hmm. The status of the case, though, is that it was fully briefed before the judge on December 18th, 2020. So it's been coming up on three months that we're simply waiting for the judge to decide what he is going to do. And uh, the choices are, he says, we have stated a claim. There, we've satisfied legally the elements of the TVPRA. And then we get discovery of the companies. Or he will say we didn't, and then we'll have to appeal to the Court of Appeals. I feel that we did meet these standards, and I'd be surprised if uh, we do anything but start moving along with that case. So in theory, you could apply to U.S. Uh, Customs Border Protection, and, and that could result in the iPhone being blocked because it contains cobalt coming into the U.S.? Yes, that Yes. Wow. It's no secret. I have uh, I've said this before that we are, in fact, working on such a petition and uh, we plan to file it in the fairly near future. What what these tech companies, Apple and Tesla and Dell, Microsoft and Google are doing in the DRC is so horrific that we're going to use every tool that we have at our disposal to to make them stop. And again, they've told the public that they don't use child labor. So uh, that is such a, a blatant lie that uh, we, we have a long way to go to bring these companies back into the fold of decent law-abiding citizens. So for those of uh, our viewers who are on Clubhouse, we'll be hosting a panel with Terry on the 26th of March at midday Pacific Standard Time to discuss his work in more detail and provide an opportunity for you guys to ask any questions you might have on this very important subject. And just in closing, I wanted to point out that unlike the big multinational companies that Terry is challenging, the victims of forced labor don't, don't have access to expensive attorneys. It's people like Terry who are working to represent these vulnerable workers. So please consider making a donation 
to his work. And Terry, could we ask uh, where the viewers go to, to reach out to you and make a donation? Sure. Thank you for, for mentioning that. Yes, the life of a nonprofit human rights organization can be a, a real roller coaster when it comes to finances. <laughs> but uh, we on our website, uh, at, which is www.iradvocates.org, iradvocates.org, we have a, a, a button you can hit to uh, donate uh, to us directly and uh, through PayPal. And uh, I think that's probably the easiest thing to do. And I would appreciate any help that uh, can come our way. Thank you. No problem, Terry. And, and again, thank you for the great work you and your team are doing. And we look forward to uh, connecting with you on Clubhouse in the next week or so. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I love, I can't wait to tell you we, we have achieved victory. <laughs> Excellent. Will you take care, sir? Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks again. And I'll see you next week then. Yep. Bye-bye.